So how do you build a program like this to, to simulate climate change and to simulate things like these hurricanes? Well, um, what you do is you take the Earth and you build a data structure that's going to represent the Earth. Um, basically, you're going to divide the Earth up into little tiny pieces and give, um, and each one of those is going to simulate what's going on in that part of the, uh, that part of the Earth, which will keep track of things like what is the temperature, is the sun shining at this particular part of the simulation, how does that heat things up, um, what does it mean, what does it do to the wind dynamics, does it create wind because of a difference in temperature between um, this part of the world and something nearby, and so on. Um, and so the couple of different data structures, there's actually a big debate right now about what's the best data structure for doing this kind of climate change. So even in this um, high energy, uh, this uh, sort of a big science area, people don't really agree on what the data structures are. So um, the one at the top there is called the cube sphere. It's like you take a cube with little boxes all around it, and you kind of squash it until it's round and it turns into a sphere. The bottom one looks like a, a soccer ball with little tiny, um, little tiny hexahedron for the uh, pieces of the soccer ball. So there's a couple different things that are that people are debating about. But that's what the, these computer simulations look like. Um, now, a question actually that, I, a good question I got the very first time I gave this lecture at CS10 was, um, how do you know that you're getting anything reasonable out of these simulations that you're doing? And the answer is it's a very good question and we spend a lot of time doing what's called validation and trying to understand um, whether we have built a model that is a theory um, and implemented it correctly in our computer software in order to get a, um, to get a correct simulation. This is data that Gil Campo from the University of Colorado um, has, has um, put together and he's actually built a big database that's available to all of the science community. Um, and what you see on the left hand side, so how do, you, how do you validate something like a climate model because the climate changes too slowly? Well, you can wait 100 years and see whether the predictions that the models um, told you were going to happen actually do happen. But of course, we don't really want to wait 100 years to see if um, all of these, these um, if the, if the uh, climate warms and uh, the sea levels rise and all these other kinds of things happen. So instead, they go back 100 years and then simulate forward going um, starting 100 years ago. Where do you get climate data that's 100 years old? Well, there's not a lot of it. And the little red dots that you hear in the left, see in the left-hand side are actual measurements um, from back about 100 years ago that they were able to, to collect. So this is um, not quite 100 years ago. 1938 was a hurricane, although they actually go back even further in their database. Um, and they, they collect these, these the data points together that come from um, you know, ships in the ocean, from naval measurements. They come from newspaper reports in little cities that have collected climate data and things like that. And then they run a bunch of very sophisticated algorithms on top of them to try to smooth out the data and fill in all the missing pieces. And they collect this data then that is um, three-dimensional data. Um, and they can tell you what the climate was like every six hours for 100 years going back in time. And then they take this data and they run it forward in time. Um, you'll see this is actually a hurricane that was hitting New York in 1938. Um, on the left hand side is the actual data, on the right hand side is the simulation, and you can see that although they don't look exactly the same, you can see that the hurricane actually is, um, does look very similar to the actual, um, to the actual data. Now, you can get really depressed looking at all the information about global climate change, um, but there is good news in it, and we use computers to try to understand how we can do things about to do things to reverse climate change. Question here. Um, addressed by Warren Washington and a number of other scientists is can global warming impacts be diminished if we actually cut significantly cut greenhouse gas emissions. And in this simulation on the bottom, we're looking at a 70% decrease in greenhouse gases. At the top, we're looking at business as usual where we would continue to produce more and more greenhouse gases. And um, the answer is yes, there's a significant difference between the top and the bottom pictures. And the top actually, um, the temperature raises um, by over three degrees Celsius and the bottom, it, um, it rises by, it's still goes up, but it rises by less than two degrees Celsius um, in, in most of the populated areas if we can cut the emissions by 70%. It turns out also some of the most significant impacts on the ocean circulation do, do not happen in the bottom um, simulations. And so there are things that can be uh, reversed if we can take into account these, uh, the, we, can, we can take advantage of various uh, mitigations. Now, um, we use simulations also to try to change the climate uh, problem by developing things like new energy efficient devices. Um, this is looking at a flame from a combustion engine. Um, there's actually an experimentalist at the lab and a, a, a mathematician at the lab that work together. John Bell is the mathematician um, in his group and uh, Robert Cheng is the experimentalist. Um, Robert Cheng has developed these things called low swirl burners. And you can tell that it's an, an energy efficient burner um, because it's not wasting any heat out the sides. And that's why he's got his hands wrapped around it with no gloves or anything is because it's a very cool burner, um, but the, the heat is 
is all coming out the top where you want it to be. Um, and you can design these things in little tiny burners that fit in your hand that you could use in something like a dryer or even smaller device. And you can have industrial scale burners, which is that big, huge one there. And they use these for um, developing heat in a, for a number of different kinds of applications. But they'd like to understand how you can use say, things like biofuels or other fuels that don't produce so much carbon in them. And that's where the mathematicians come in with their simulations. And this is a simulation that tells them something about the details of the um, combustion process and exactly how to design these burners to make them um, both as energy efficient as possible and also make it possible to use other kinds of fuels. Um, another um, example of a, um, an energy efficient device is looking at how you store energy. Um, and this is actually turning sunlight into thermal energy, into heat. So storing it as heat that you can release later. Um, and this is a, a little video. We'll see if this works from um, Jeff Grossman, who We're actually used to be at UC Berkeley and is now on the faculty on at MIT. Spinning around here. And what it can do is it can store energy from the sun internally and release that energy later as heat on demand. It works in some ways like a rechargeable battery. It can be charged and reused many times over. In this case, the charging occurs simply by exposure to sunlight. So when the sun strikes this molecule, it undergoes a reaction that transforms it into a higher energy state or a charged state. And this particular molecule is a special case. It can do this reaction in a reversible manner with no degradation. That means that once transformed by the sun, it stays stable, making it safe and transportable. Then, using a simple catalyst, the molecule can be made to go back into its original state. And as it goes back into its original state, it releases that stored energy as heat. And this makes it essentially a rechargeable heat battery. What we wanted to know is why this particular case is unique. Why it's so stable and does not degrade over time, unlike other molecules that have been tried before. So we carried out quantum mechanical calculations in order to understand the heat release mechanism. And what we found was quite surprising. As the molecule proceeds along the reaction pathway from the higher energy state back to the original state, it was thought to have only a single barrier. But the calculations revealed the presence of this intermediate state, which means it has two barriers along the pathway instead of one. And that has important implications for how the fuel is stabilized. And what we find is that the relative barrier heights along this path play a crucial role in its functionality. Using this knowledge, we're now working to develop further improvements in the fuel, such as the use of cheaper materials and also increased storage densities.